Wow. Wow. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Nir, founder of Palo Alto Networks. And like every year, I want to talk about the future of cybersecurity. And maybe start with this. Every time I open a paper after a big data breach and, and look at what is it that they used to depict the, the bad guy, it's always one of two. Either someone with a hoodie, usually some matrix, um, like uh, elements in the, in, the in the photo, or a bunch of foreign national soldiers sitting in front of computers and hacking you. <laughs> and, and this is great, because the way we defend against those guys is what everybody here does, is we build security operation centers, and we put a bunch of systems there, usually a SIEM, and, and we deploy 40 different cybersecurity technologies, all best of breed, to look for signs of attacks, and you know, the bad guys will type something in, and something will pop up in the SIEM, and, and one of our security operation center people, one of our security experts is going to respond to that, and then the bad guy is going to be shocked that they were stopped, and they're going to try something else, and then you know, our guys is going to get another, or our girls are going to get another event in their SIEM, and they're going to respond to that, and so on. And, and the great news about this story is that half of it is true. The half word, this is the way we protect against the bad guys. And the sad news is that the first half is not true, and it's in the media. I think someone should come up with a name for something that's not true in the media. And, <laughs> and, and these aren't the hackers. These are not the ones, or the bad guys. These are not the ones that attack us. And I think that maybe to talk about who are really those that attack us, it's better if we hear it from a real-world hacker, someone with 20 years' experience of hacking, an ethical hacker, and maybe before getting that hacker on stage, I was warned to put my phone, um, actually turn it off completely, not even, in, um, not even in airplane mode, because being in the vicinity of that person with a phone is very, very dangerous. So, you know, let's hear from uh, a real-world ethical hacker about who the Ladies real Ladies and gentlemen, are. please welcome Karen Elazari. No, I haven't hacked a phone on stage since 2012, so don't worry, everybody, you're safe. At least the people here in the front rows. So good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to be here with you. This is my opportunity to invite you to join me on a journey, a journey to my world, the hacker's world. So I hope you hold on tight to your seats because this will be a fast ride. You ready? Let's go. I have a confession to make, just to tell you a little bit something about myself. Growing up in sunny Tel Aviv, I always wanted to do and be one thing and one thing alone. I wanted to be a hacker. And I know this is still kind of what you're thinking about when you hear about hackers in the news, but I was something completely different. I was a very curious little girl, and I kept asking questions. And sometimes the only place to find the answers to all of my questions, well, it was other people's computers. What can you do? A curious child is a curious child. So I taught myself how to code. I taught myself how to hack. And in 1993, when we first got the internet in Tel Aviv, I was the happiest little girl around. And in the interest of trust and transparency, this is not exactly what I looked like. Let me show you a more accurate photo. So this picture is from the actual yearbook photo of my school. And it's not a trick question. I know some of you are going to try and see if you can find me in that picture. It's gonna be a little bit difficult for you. I hope you're ready. Here's the honest to God truth. I was that nerdy little kid in the corner. The weirdo. In fact, I was so much of a nerd, I looked like a little boy, and the kids playing Dungeons and Dragons wouldn't let me join their team. <laughs> can you believe it? True story, and I haven't forgiven them since. However, I found better hobbies, better pastimes, and more importantly, better friends and better mentors. And I found my calling, all because of one particular mentor, this person, this woman, who showed me the path into the hacker's world. Now, hopefully you recognize her from this photo, because her name is Angelina Jolie. <laughs> 1995, she portrayed a fierce high school hacker called Acid Burn. And she was everything that I wanted to be, because she was the hero of the story. She used her hacking skills to not only uncover corporate corruption, to stop an ecological catastrophe, and to show the FBI who the real criminal was. 
Not the hackers, but the bad guys. So that's what I wanted to become. Since then, I've dedicated my life and my career to studying what real-world hackers can do. The friendly hackers, the ethical hackers, and the malicious criminals and nation states. And this is what I have here to show you, how these hackers operate. But more importantly, I want to give you an idea that hackers are not always what we think they are. In fact, they really can be the heroes of the story. In my life, I've been inspired by real-world hackers, not just Hollywood figures. Real-world hackers like Barnaby Jack. He was an infamous hacker from New Zealand. And he first raised to, his first claim to fame was actually hacking ATMs and literally making those ATMs throw money at him, a technique which was promptly called jackpotting in his honor. However, after that, he got bored with ATMs and moved on to hacking medical devices. And Barnaby Jack proved that with a radio antenna and the right signal, he could actually remotely hack an embedded insulin pump. These are devices that have already vastly improved the lives of hundreds and thousands of diabetic patients around the world. However, they just run on a small embedded microcomputer. And with the right command, Barnaby could trigger this pump to immediately release any remaining insulin in the pump's reservoir in one direct hit into a patient's bloodstream. That could be lethal and very scary, but he never hurt a soul. In fact, it was Barnaby who said that sometimes it is up to us hackers to demonstrate the threat so that we can spark a solution in the world. And I absolutely believe in this point of view. In fact, he was the inspiration for me to go on the annual international TED stage and share the message that hackers can actually be the internet's immune system. This is an idea that quite a lot of people have resonated with. However, it's not enough. We don't just need the friendly hackers to help us out. In this day and age, we need that immune system to comprise of everybody, every organization, every security professional, and every individual. Because in 2018, cybersecurity, it's no longer just about, you know, your credit card number, ma'am, or your Facebook friend, sir. No, it's not about our secrets at all. Cybersecurity is about protecting our way of life, our new connected digital world, and the technologies that we place trust in implicitly every morning when we walk out the door, every day when we go to sleep safely in our beds at night. So how can we create such a future, and what do we need to make that immune system work better? Today, I want to give you a few of my ideas, some predictions about the future of cybersecurity, and especially what we need to know about what attackers are doing so that we can get safer. And my number one prediction for you might be something that you've heard before, but it bears repeating. The perimeter is dead. Long live the new perimeter, which lives everywhere that data and computing resources are. And it doesn't matter if these are the endpoints, the on-demand microservices, the cloud containers, the endpoints in your pockets, or the computer in your car. All of these new computing interfaces are going to require us to protect them and to set out new types of perimeter controls. And that requires a completely different type of thinking. It's not enough that some of these computing efforts and computing power are going to be subverted by attackers. As we move forward to the future with all of the amazing new technologies, we are still going to carry with us some of the baggage of the past, namely some of these older, out-of-date, end-of-life operating systems. Now, this would have been funnier if it wasn't because of all of these end-of-life operating systems and the vulnerabilities and holes in them that such major worldwide attacks took place just in the past year. I'm certain you've heard about this terrible exploit called Eternal Blue that utilized the vulnerability in some of the Windows SMB protocols in the older operating system environments. This was exactly the exploit that allowed the infamous WannaCry ransomware to spread like wildfire. And what's unique here is that the attackers have figured out ways to make their attacks much more impactful by creating automatic propagation mechanisms and worm-like mechanisms, exactly like we saw with WannaCry. And just a month after WannaCry, even though everybody heard about it and even though the patches had already been released, just a month after that, a new type of attack, this time only pretending to be a ransomware, but actually a wiper, and of course, I'm talking about the infamous NotPetya virus. Now check this out. This is the small data center somewhere in the Ukraine where NotPetya actually began its journey. This is the patient zero. By the way, I love their state-of-the-art cooling solution. <laughs> I swear I had just the same cool solution back in the 90s with my overclocked PC. 
But this small data center, it wasn't just the patient zero for this wiper attack for NotPetya. It turns out that for the two years prior to that, for two years, the small tax software company that resides, that uses this data center, their premises and their data center was actually manipulated by the attackers in order to use their software update mechanism to send out malicious software to all of their customers and all of the organizations that work with them in the Ukraine and across Europe for two years. So the wiper wasn't actually out there to raise money through ransom. It was there to delete the evidence of everything that was going on for the past two years throughout their software update mechanism. And not only that, NotPetya utilized a lot of automatic techniques to spread through many organizations. Not just the eternal blue exploit, but also tools like Mimikatz, which is an automated Windows credential harvesting tool, originally created by a security researcher, by the way. And they also used legitimate tools like PSExec and the Windows management instrumentation interfaces. It makes it very difficult to uncover these attacks when they use automation and legitimate tools and are subverting them for their own uses. In fact, if I'm talking about Mimikatz, I should all you tell, also tell you about one of mine. So one of mine is a brand new type of worm. This time, it uses the eternal blue exploit to spread around the organization, and it also uses Mimikatz, that Windows credential harvesting tool I just told you about. But the result is not ransom, it's actually a cryptocurrency. So this worm actually uses computers and these exploits to mine for a new type of cryptocurrency, an alternative to Bitcoin. This is a cryptocurrency called Monero, which is quite favored by criminals because of its untraceable qualities. And we're going to see more attacks just like this in the future. As more computing assets become available to criminals, they will automate and move fast to monetize them quickly. <clears throat> Now, just last month, I don't know how many of you have seen this, but this is really important. Just last, last month, the UK's National Cybersecurity Center released this really big report with lots of technical details in it, ex explaining exactly how, in their view, in their analysis, Russian state actors have been targeting network infrastructure devices. And when we say network infrastructure devices, that means routers, it means gateways, it even means certain types of network-based IDS, intrusion detection engines and systems. So these attackers have been scanning broadly without discri discrimination, without distinction throughout the internet, looking for organizations that they can subvert and attack using the security tools, using the routers, using the gateways as the easy ways in. If you haven't read this report, you have to take a look at it because it's filled with indicators of compromise and the technical analysis that you need to know to protect your organizations better. They even use something called SMI, which is a Cisco interface to, man not manually, but rather automatically install and deploy new routers. So, if you don't believe me that so many systems and gateways and routers and servers can be accessible and exploitable online, don't take my word for it. Take a look at Shodan which is a search engine for connected devices. Through Shodan, you can identify vulnerable, potentially internet-connected systems that should not be. And in fact, you may already be familiar with this tool, and you might be familiar with the next tool I'm going to show you. That's, of course, Metasploit, one of the world's most uh, prevalent and popular exploitation frameworks, a tool that every security engineer and pen tester knows. In fact, I recently met a few uh, hackers back in Chicago. I asked somebody, hey, do you know Metasploit? And he said, of course, and how long have you been training on how to use it? Well, he said, well, I've, I've been working on it for 10 years and I'm still learning. So this framework is always evolving and it requires a steep learning curve. However, thanks to another security researcher, just a few months ago, a new tool has been released out into the wild. Meet Autosploit. It's a combination of Shodan's mass scanning capabilities with Metasploit's automated exploit delivery cap de deploy and capability. So when you bring these two tools together, and by the way, it's just 400 lines of Python code, you bring these two tools together, any criminal, even a script kiddie like I was, could quickly learn how to use it and go from targeting to exploitation to owning in a matter of hours or minutes. Check it out, this is the interface. It is so simple to learn how to use. There's no excuse for a defender not to know this tool because the criminals and the bad guys are gonna use it and they're gonna use it fast and automatically to target any organization that they would like. Talking about automation, it's definitely going to be a part of the attack landscape. In fact, just two years ago, 
the United States Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, the DARPA agency, hosted a one-of-its-kind competition. This was a competition for computers to automatically hack other computers. This is what it looked like in a big ballroom in Las Vegas during the DEF CON hacking convention. Some of you may have been there. Now imagine you're in this big ballroom and there's a competition taking place between seven machines, supercomputers designed by teams of humans but operating completely autonomously, identifying vulnerabilities, exploiting them, and trying to mitigate and defend against the attacks of the other machines. Ladies and gentlemen, meet the future. This is mayhem. This is the first non-human entity to ever win a hacking competition. If you'd like to visit it, it's actually now at the American History Museum in Washington, D.C., the second floor next to the ladies' room. I went there just a couple months ago to say hello. But this is the future, and what a lot of people don't realize about mayhem and machines like it is that the year after the Cyber Grand Challenge in 2017, this machine and other machines like it, like it graduated to compete against human teams of hackers. In 2017, the machines did not win. However, can we be certain that that is going to be our future? I'm pretty sure that in the years to come, we were going to see more and more such supercomputers used by both defenders and adversaries. So, can we sleep safely in our beds at night? Can we still do the same things we did yesterday and last year? Expecting different results? No, therein lies madness. We have to evolve because the attackers are evolving. They go big and upstream. They use software update mechanisms to subvert systems. They use all types of old and new operating system exploits, including operating systems of network devices. They use fileless attacks. They subvert legitimate tools like Mimikatz and Shodan and Metasploit and PSXEC and other administration tools that we all should have in our systems and use all the time. And finally, they are utilizing attack automation in a scale which has never before been seen around the world. So that is going to be our threat landscape, that is going to be our future. And to learn a little bit more about what you can do to protect yourself and the organizations that depend on you from these threats, I'd like to invite Nir back to the stage. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Oh. Okay, thank you, Karen. So the bad guys aren't what we think they are, right? They're not this hooded person or the soldiers sitting in front of computers and trying to hack us. And the bad guys are a little bit more automated and they use anything from combining tools like Shodan and, and Metasploit all the way through AI. And I, I agree with Karen, I think in 10 years we're going to see AI hacking us, no human intervention, and they're going to do a much better job and of course, much more scalable job than what the human hackers do today. And you know, when, when I talk to customers about who the adversary is, and most customers will tell me, we don't even try to defend against nation states. Well, we worry about nation states, but we know there's nothing we can do, so we're going to focus on protecting against the criminals, the industrial espionage, and, and so on. What about AI? I would place AI above nation states, so we're just going to write it off and go home and What's, what's the plan there? Certainly the plan should not be keep doing what we're doing today, which is deploy 40 different best of breeds technologies and put humans in front of screens, beautiful screens usually, you know, with, the, with a lot of events and lights and it looks really great when you bring executives to see it and, and create all the right processes and all the right playbooks and everything and hire the, the, the best people, but still we're fighting machines. And we're going to fight machines more and more and more. And someone sm sm really smart once said, don't bring a human to a machine fight, right? Call the machine from the future to come and help you fight the machine. And, and, and that really changes how our future needs to look. We have to change course and we have to plan for a different future than I think we are planning today. And, you know, if, if, if you're a truck driver, and or if, if, if you talk to a truck driver and that truck, that truck driver, highway truck driver believes that in 10 years they're going to be driving a truck on the freeway, then you're probably going to think that they might be you know, putting their head in the sand, right? And that they have to take the head out of the sand because in 10 years nobody will be driving trucks on the freeway. It's going to be machines that are going to be driving trucks on the freeway and maybe it's time right now for that truck driver, truck driver to change course and, and, and maybe be in a different place in 10 years, but 
you know, a security operation center that's built around SIMs and around events and, and, and 40 different products and, and all manual work, all written really well in playbooks. That doesn't sound weird to you? To me, it does, as much as the truck driver sounds weird to me when they think they're going to have a job driving a truck on the freeway in 10 years. So in order to change the future, I think we need to understand what the future is. And in the future, we're going to have machines fighting machines. Our security operation centers are going to be built around machines, unlike today where humans use machines to help them fight what they think are humans, in reality are machines, we're going to have machines use humans for their help. So the machines are going to do almost all the work, and humans are going to be the exception. Whenever the machine can't do something, whenever the machine has a problem that it cannot solve, whenever a decision has to be made that cannot be made by a machine, those are going to be the exceptions, and they're going to go to the human operator or the human security analyst in the security operation center. We're going to need more of these security operation center people just because the number of attacks and the sophistication of attacks is going to be much higher once we start dealing with more and more sophisticated automation. On the other side, they're going to have to be better trained, and of course, they're going to need different tools than they are using today. And, and those tools and the tools that are going to run the security operation center can all be put under the, the label of analytics. And <clears throat> I'm not talking about the analytics that we use today or what we call analytics today, which is a bunch of queries and correlation and, and other basic stuff that we might be doing in the security operations center. I'm talking about machine learning. I'm talking about things that our marketing people might call AI one day. And, and, and maybe to explain what machine learning is, which is, again, a very important tool, even today, but certainly in the future, fighting what's on the other side, automation, and the AI on the other side, maybe I think it's going to be a good thing if I take a couple of minutes to explain what machine learning is, uh, and, and especially the two types of machine learning, two types of machine learning that are important for cybersecurity. The first, or maybe before that, um, going back to the, the, the highway truck that's going to be driven by, by, by a machine, not by a person in 10 years, how do you build a self-driving car? Well, one option you have to build a self-driving car is you hire hundreds of engineers, give them really good food and really good drinks in a really nice office in downtown San Francisco, and, and, and let them write the code for a self-driving car, right? And they can start coding it, and if you see a green light, this is what you do. If you see a red light, this is what you do. If you see a yellow light, you look for police, and based on that, you decide what to do, and, <laughs> and, and so on. And the, the thing is that there are so many different conditions, they'll never finish writing the software. There are so many rules that are required to drive a car, they'll never finish riding it, and even if they do, which they won't, they'll be wrong, what, 1% of the time, 2%, 5% of the time? Cars cannot be wrong 1% of the time, okay? A better approach would be you buy hundreds of cars, you equip them with all kinds of sensors, laser, sonar, radar, visual, whatever, put human drivers in them and let them drive and drive and drive into as many different situations as possible, while they drive, you collect all the data that the sensors, sensors see, as well as what has been the human reaction, bring all that data into one big data lake, into one big one place, and now you have enough data to understand how to drive a car. And this is what machine learning is about. Machine learning is about, rather than humans writing the rules under which software needs to operate, you have machines write the rules under which machines need to operate using data. And that's machine learning. And there are many types of machine learning. Maybe the two relevant ones today will be supervised machine learning. In supervised machine learning, we give the machine data that is labeled. In our case, in cybersecurity, it's, the data is going to be labeled good and bad. Maybe when you use it in healthcare, the DNA sequence will be labeled healthy and, and sick and, and so on. So you have labeled data, again, in our case, good and bad, and it can be Good, good executables, bad executables. Good uh, documents, bad documents. Good traffic, bad traffic. Good URLs, bad URLs. Good domains, bad domains. And a you know, very small number of use cases. And then, assuming you have enough data and very high quality data, meaning in the case of malware, you have tens of millions of malware files, but they have to be malware. There can't be any false positives over there. And you have tens of millions of non-malware files, benign files, but they have to be non-malware. You can't have malware in there. You can now teach a machine, and there are many different ways to do that, and you should do all of them because different teaching will do different things. You can teach a machine how to predict whether a file that the machine has never seen before is malware or not. And you can do the same thing with others. Um, 
The difficulty with, with supervised machine learning is, is on our side, is on the vendor side. How do you come up with tens of millions of examples of good and bad? Whatever that good and bad is. Once you do, and it's not something easy, it's not something you do overnight, you can't just go to the internet and download it from some, some service or some website because they have too many false positives and too many false negatives. It's a lot of work, but once you do that, you can build many different machine learning algorithms, many different machine learning predictive models to predict whether something is good or bad. So, Again, the, the, the difficulty here is on our side. Another type of, ma of machine learning is, surprisingly, unsupervised machine learning. And with unsupervised machine learning, you give the machine data that is not labeled. The machine doesn't know what the data is, and you ask the machine, please tell me something about the data. And usually, that something is going to be, there is a piece of data here that just doesn't make sense. I looked at all the data, the machine will say, I looked at all the data, and I created rules to understand the data, but there are some things here that don't fall under these rules. And in cybersecurity, we would call those things anomalies. So unsupervised machine learning, it, number one, has many more use cases than supervised machine learning in cybersecurity and, by the way, and everything else. And then second, unsupervised machine learning is really good at finding things just don't make sense, anomalies or, or things that um, are very different than, than everything else that's, that's there. And once you know about an anomaly, you can take care of it automatically using different type of machine learning, like deep learning and other things, or you can throw it at a human and have the human maybe deal with, with, the, with, the, with the anomaly. Uh, the important thing about unsupervised machine learning is that unsupervised machine learning requires a lot of data, and it requires a lot of your data. Unlike supervised, where the data is on us, finding the right data is on us, with unsupervised, it's your data. And when I talk to customers today and I look at the kind of data that they collect, I would say that the rule of thumb is that the amount of data that you need in order to run unsupervised machine learning for cybersecurity is about 100 times more than you collect today into your SIMs. So take whatever you do today in the SIM, multiply it by 100. You need to multiply the infrastructure by 1,000 because you need much more compute to do this. You need to multiply by 100 the number of people that operate it and the operational cost around operating your um, data collection today, and this is the number that you need to put around uh, how much it's going to cost to run unsupervised machine learning, which of course is not feasible. So we need a completely different approach to do unsupervised machine learning. And remember where we started, right? The bad guys are automated. Very soon we're going to fight AI, and we can decide, like nation states, we're not going to deal with that and keep dealing with the you know, simple stuff, or we can deal with that using our own analytics and our own machine learning, our own what, again, future marketing people might call AI. And, and, and to do that, we need supervised machine learning, which is easy, and we need unsupervised machine learning, which is very tough, and it requires a completely different infrastructure. The other thing about unsupervised machine learning is that there are so many different things you could do in unsupervised machine learning that in the future, and even now, but certainly in the future, you will need to be able to consume cybersecurity innovation much, much quicker. Today, probably it takes you many months, maybe even years, to decide, buy, and deploy a new cybersecurity technology, right? If you wanted a new technology today, you'd have to go and test it and then deploy it. Usually, you won't deploy it throughout your entire infrastructure. You're going to choose very strategic location and deploy there, and that's a very, very long process. In the future, you'll have to do it in a matter of hours, maybe even minutes, because there's going to be a new threat and the response to that threat is going to have to be very, very quick because the other side is automated and the, otherwise is, the other side is using pure, okay, let's call it AI. Um, I just don't like that term, but let's call it AI. And, and you, you just can't wait months until you respond to that. You need to wait. You need to do it very, very, very rapidly. You need new technology right now to go and fight this new threat that's spreading around the world or just... You know, you'll be wasting your time. And, and if you combine these two together, you really look at a disruptive situation. We have to redo the way we do security operation centers. We have to redo the way we collect data, the way we store data, the way we work on data, the way and, and what we do with the data. And then we also have to change how we consume technology, how do we consume, how we consume innovation so that we can respond rapidly and quickly to the changing conditions out there and be able to deploy a new cybersecurity technology across the entire infrastructure, network, endpoint, private cloud, public cloud, SaaS, anything within minutes and hours, not months and years that it takes today. And for that, Palo Alto Networks has created two things that we call the logging service and the application framework, 
I talked about it last year. You'll hear more about it this year. I'm not going to get into that today. But this is the context around the logging service and the application framework. I think this tool sets you on the path to intercept whatever, whenever that happens, 10 years into the future, maybe less, the other side being completely automated, completely using AI, completely um, um, changing itself all the time. So pay attention to the logging service and the application framework and the other presentations you're going to hear today and tomorrow and the breakouts around those, very, very important, okay? Now, I've been standing here on stage, this is sixth year, I think, right? This is our sixth year of Ignite. And every year I've been trying to convince the audience, to convince you, that this approach to best of breed and buying different products from different vendors, while it sounds great and it you know, gives a lot of work to a lot of people, is not necessarily the right approach for different reasons. And every year I brought a different reason and every year more and more customers get convinced of that and more and more of our customers use us for multiple things. Network security, endpoint security, private cloud security, public cloud security, SaaS security, and, and, and you know, I, I want to bring another reason this year to why to do that. But maybe before that, I would like to invite Karen back to stage to explain to you how attacks are a little bit different today so that I can talk about another reason why you want your entire infrastructure to work together as one platform. So Karen, please come back to stage yeah, and tell you. us about attacks. I will. Thank you, Nir. Thanks so much. Thank you, Nir. So, you know, I love it that you have a picture of this beautiful fish tank, this beautiful aquarium. I don't know if you've heard, but this was a story that definitely caught my attention. Earlier this year, a fantastic casino somewhere here in North America installed a beautiful exotic fish tank for the enjoyment and entertainment of their customers. Now, this wasn't just any fish tank. No, this is a high-tech smart aquarium. And why might you need a smart aquarium, I hear you asking. Great question. So one reason is to track the salinity of the water. Another is to make sure that the exotic fish are getting fed on time and that the temperature is just right for them. And of course, this smart aquarium that is equipped with sensors also has an unsecured outbound connection to the internet. Turns out that's exactly what the criminals had been waiting for. Because for several months, a group of cyber criminals were already lurking in that casino's corporate network. Because of some of the defenses and the firewalls that that network had, they weren't able to take the data out until they found this aquarium. And so over the period of two weeks, silently, just like the fish, they stole 10 terabytes of data, exfiltrated slowly but surely just outside of that aquarium. In fact, this attack was only discovered after the fact, a few months after the fact, and only because of a combination of a new type of adaptive machine learning algorithm and a team of human intelligence analysts. So a little bit of AI and a lot of human intelligence that was put to work in order to identify this attack. Criminals will use whatever they can get their hands on. In fact, maybe you heard about this famous place where you get coffee, although recently, a few customers of this particular coffee chain also had their computers logging onto the free Wi-Fi, a benefit advertised by this particular coffee chain. Using that Wi-Fi, they discovered that their computers were actually mining another type of cryptocurrency because somebody managed to sneak a small JavaScript called CoinHive into that landing page. So every time you go into the free Wi-Fi or every time the customers of that particular chain in a particular country south of the border went online, their computers spent about 10 seconds mining cryptocurrency for a criminal. And this doesn't just happen in retail. It also happened or a similar thing happened to another famous company, a very innovative company. Their cloud instances, this is one of the world's um, perhaps one of the world's just most innovative companies, period. Their, one of their cloud instances and their AWS credentials were also used by criminals to, you guessed it, mine cryptocurrencies. The reason that criminals love cryptocurrency mining so much is because it gives them an immediate bang for the buck. Once they own a system, once they've got some compute power, they can immediately turn that into money. And they're going to do just that. And maybe you heard about this different company, a very popular ride-sharing company um, that also had some of their assets used, not just for cryptocurrency mining, not just for Bitcoin mining, but for something completely different. In fact, in their case, it was a password that was left in an unsecured public GitHub repository, a password that led to the breach of millions of customer and 
employee data records. So even the most smart, innovative, well-funded, and talented security teams on the planet can't defend from all of these types of attacks and methods that criminals will get in. This next story I'm going to show you, this is actually about, uh, ver this, is, this was the car company, but the next story is about this uh, big group of attackers that has been called by some people a factory of malware. This is the Lazarus group. And the Lazarus group, they became infamous last year when it was discovered that they used a bunch of sophisticated attacks to get into the SWIFT, that's the global network for wire transfers between banks, to get onto the SWIFT infrastructure. They didn't just get into the SWIFT infrastructure. In fact, they started their hack, they started this hack by something that looked benign but was actually quite malicious. What they did was hack the website for the Polish Financial Authority. And not just the Polish financial authority, they hacked the central websites of several financial authorities around the world, in Russia, in Latin America, in the Far East, because they were banking on the fact that people that work in the banks in those countries visit these websites quite frequently. And so they used what is called a watering hole attack. They used these websites that are visited frequently by their victims to get malicious files, mal malicious droppers, and later malware installed in those banks' infrastructure and network. Then they search in the network with lateral movement for the SWIFT servers. They stole credentials, they put in custom malware, they deleted the logs of everything they had done, and they even put in filters to make sure that if the SWIFT servers sends any internal messages, they can get those first before the bank's employees so they can really erase all of the records of their transactions. Ultimately, they managed to steal more than $81 million from several bank accounts, including the Central Bank of Bangladesh. By the way, this attack was only discovered because of one small typo in one of the bank transfers. They sent out a transfer to a, a foundation in the Philippines, but they spelled foundation with an A. And that was the only reason that a human analyst in one of the banks that processed the transfer flagged it as a potentially irrelevant, illegitimate transaction. Now this group, the Lazarus group, that's just one type of attack that they do. And goes to show you that the criminals and the attackers, they're using a multifaceted approach. So if they're tra targeting an organization or if they find a, a victim that they want to set their mind to, they're not going to settle for a locked window or you know, one door, one gateway. If those are locked, they're going to go through the back door. If the back door is not available to them, they will create patches for a software that you use to get that, their malicious code into your network. If that doesn't work, they're going to find an employee and maybe bribe them or otherwise get their credentials. They're going to use all kinds of tools at their disposal, of a wide arsenal. This is why the Lazarus Group has been dubbed by some a factory of malware, because they keep evolving their attacks. They keep creating new code. They keep creating new types of attacks that it would be very difficult for an organization working alone to identify. This requires an ecosystem approach. In fact, when we consider the multifaceted aspect of many of these attacks that I showed you and the ones that you have to deal with on a daily basis, we have to realize that an organization dealing alone with all of these problems, utilizing the same approaches that we have in the past years, is not going to make it. It requires a different type of thinking. It also requires harmonization and orchestration of your security efforts throughout your cloud instances, your SaaS applications, on-prem, off-prem, whatever endpoints you have, whatever partners, whatever other third-party technology that you're using. As a security professional, you simply need to have eyes everywhere, which is kind of no longer possible for humans to do alone. This is why I'm a big believer in the power of technology, and I think that machine learning, automation, algorithms, definitely are going to play a big part in our future. We're going to have this you know, algorithm man sitting next to us, trying to help us as security professionals do our job better. But there's still going to be room for humans. In fact, if we look at the big picture of cybersecurity, if you look at it as a pyramid, if you will, perhaps the automation, the machine learning, the technology, the metrics, that can provide us with the basic defense. That is the science of cybersecurity defense. That is maybe the 70% or the 65 or 85, depends on your organization. That is the basic bread and butter of defense. But we are always going to have to do that art. We're going to have to always have the people and the talent and the capability to do the threat hunting, to do the incident response and the forensics, to do red team testing. We are always going to need that hacker mindset 
to help us get there, fused with the best technology that we can evolve and create together. And you know what, personally, I'm actually excited that some of the talent of the future, you know, next year when we meet here at Ignite, it's not just going to be us here. Maybe we'll have some robots among us, but also we might have some retired truck drivers who found a new career, or some Girl Scouts who started their path into this industry because of programs like the one you're gonna hear about next. The cybersecurity industry requires a million more security professionals in years to come, despite all the automation and all of the new technologies that are created. And I think that's great, because we're going to welcome people from all walks of life and all kinds of mindsets and you know, outlooks into our midst. But more than that, ultimately, our future should not be defined by our battle with technology. We must not let that happen. Our future should be defined by how we choose to use technology, how we use it for our benefit, how we use it to create better things, how we can use it to build a better and safer world for everybody in it, including the machines. And the choice to do that, that choice can start right here today with you because you can immerse yourself in the knowledge that you need to do that. And to learn more about the choices that we're gonna have to make, I'd like to invite Nir back, please, to tell you more about what you can do. Thank you, everybody, and I'll see you later. Sayonara. Thank you, Karen. Okay, thank you, Karen. So, the bad guys are using everything they can to get into our infrastructure, and I think more importantly, they're using attacks coming from different locations and they jump from one type of infrastructure to another type of infrastructure to do whatever it takes. And as I said, I've been standing up on this stage, this is the sixth year, asking you to stop buying best of breed because best of breed just doesn't work. Everything has to work together. The bad guys are coming from all different directions and they don't care that you use the best product in each location. If these pro products don't talk to each other, if these products don't work together to find the bad guys, and these products don't work together to respond to the bad guys, then these products are not going to do their job. They're not going to find the sophisticated attacks that are coming from different areas. And, and, and one, of these, one of these areas, that, that I, I wanna talk about today or maybe give you another example of why it's important to look at different attacks also has to do with what Karen talked about at the end, which is, yeah, the world has more and more, or the future has more and more automation and the future has more and more machine learning and AI on the attack side and of course on the defense side, but there's still people and we'll still need people and there will always be people doing an important part of the work, we'll need more and more people doing more and more sophisticated things in order to defend our infrastructure. And <clears throat> maybe on the people side, and one of the tools that these people use today and how that tool needs to involve is EDR. Anyone here using EDR? Anyone here looking at EDR? I'm sure many of you are thinking about it and looking at it. EDR is Endpoint Detection and Response. Endpoint Detection and Response is about collecting data from endpoints, and doing things with the data. So there are different type of things you can do, and actually there are different vendors focusing on different areas, which by itself is a mistake. I think you should do all of them. Uh, the first thing you can do with data that you collect from endpoints is hunt, hunt for attacks. Look for things that just don't make sense in that data, and as I said, there are EDR vendors focused on hunting tools, a lot of visualization, a lot of information being really crunched into very small pieces of visual, data or visual, visualization that can then be used to, to, for, by a human to notice things that machines can't really notice, like a spelling mistake in the name of a, of a trust that to which, or foundation to which you transfer money to. So this is one type of EDR. The other type of EDR, again, endpoint detection in response, uh, is used to uh, um, investigate breach, breaches or potential breaches. If you think something happened or if you know something happened, there is a lot of data on endpoints. If you collected the data in advance or it's on the endpoint and you can bring it in, you can look at the data and maybe figure out better what happened. There are companies, EDR tools that are dedicated to that. And then maybe the third thing that you can do with EDR is more around uh, being able to compare data from endpoints with threat intelligence data, with IOCs, indicator of compromise or business indicator of compromise, and in all cases then respond back. And the challenge I have with EDR is that the, the viewpoint that you get on an endpoint is very, very limited. 
It's one of these cases that I talk about again every year where if you try to do things separately, then you're just not going to, 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 to get the full benefit that you can get from doing it across the entire infrastructure. On the endpoint, there is good data, but by no means enough data to understand what happened in an attack, right? If an attacker managed to, 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 to get a weaponized PowerPoint presentation into your Office 365 instance, and then one of your users pulls that Office 365, uh, that document, a PowerPoint presentation, and opens it and exploits a vulnerability, and then it downloads an executable that the bad guy stored on some website that they know you offer access to, um, I don't know, let's say Facebook. So they bring that from Facebook, and, and the executable it's now installed, and uh, maybe Facebook cannot store, install that, but let's say Box or Dropbox, and they, they bring that in, and they install the executable, and then they're on your computer and that computer, and then they jump maybe to another endpoint, and maybe to an aquarium, and then from there, they, they make their way into, into your data center, and then from there, jump to your public cloud infrastructure, and so on. You're going to see very small part of it on an endpoint. But if you looked at data coming from the network, from the endpoint, from SaaS applications, whether they're your SaaS applications or they're un unsanctioned SaaS applications. Um, well, if, if you look at data coming from your public cloud, from your private cloud, uh, from your uh, data center firewalls and so on, if you look at data coming from all of this, you're going to be able to see a much better picture of the attack. And then whether a human looking at the data or a machine looking at the data with the help of a human, you're going to get a much, be much better picture. You're going to have a much better chance of hunting for attacks, a much better chance of understanding what happened if something already happened, and a much better chance of matching IOCs to the data. And we call that XDR. Okay, it's not endpoint detection and response, it's network detection and response, it's not cloud detection, private cloud, public cloud, it's not SaaS detection and response. You know, we would have to use so many acronyms, right? SDR and NDR and PDR and, and whatever, we just decided that the name is XDR, anything detection and response. And EDR, as popular as it is right now, I predict is dead. It just doesn't make any sense to do detection and response based on data coming just from endpoints. I think that the right way to do it is to take data from everywhere, take data from the network, from endpoints, from private clouds, from public clouds, from SaaS, potentially from other sources like threat intelligence, and then performing all these different things that we have there, all the different things that I talked about, and potentially other things, and do it in a, in, in a way that the, the thing at the top, the, the light blue there at the top, can come from anyone. It can come from Palo Alto Networks, it can come from our partners, it can come from our competitors, it can come from anyone. And again, in the future, you'll be, have to deploy these kind of technologies very, very, very rapidly. And this is one of the things that the application framework enables. Uh, you'll hear maybe a little bit more about that today, probably in the future. And before I finish, I'd just like to say that we're going to have a break right now. And after the break, we're going to have the best part of the day. We're going to have Lee Claridge, who runs products for Palo Alto Networks, come on stage and share very, very exciting information. If there is one presentation, if there's one thing you want to hear this week, it's probably Lee Claridge and the people that talk with him about things that we're doing and things that we're going to do and the progress that we've made with the application framework. So someone here is going to tell you that there is a break, I think. Um, uh, again, please make sure you listen to, to the next uh, section. Very, very important. So thank you. And hasta la vista.